From the bayous in Louisiana to the Camber country up north, you'll find them out on the trap line, chasing furs to put up on the border. Mixing up another batch of that magical stuff, chilling around the fire after the show. Hey, it's Sarah and Jeff, and maybe a guest on the trapping radio. Welcome to Trapping Radio. We are here at Trapping Camp, and uh, we are with a special guest. Um, what did we call it earlier? A three-peat. A three-peat. So Chris Walter is joining us today, and uh, we have been with Chris all week uh, trapping muskrats here in North Dakota. So uh, Chris is um, familiar with the show. He's been listening for a long time, and I know Clint supported that, and uh, we sure appreciate you listening to this show and uh, being on here for the third time. So last time you were on here, we were on a fishing boat, and uh, we were catching walleye and trout and salmon, and now we're catching muskrats. So anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks for agreeing to sit down with us. And... uh, in North Dakota. In North Dakota. I guess you have no choice. We're kind of all trapped here together. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but, uh, um, anyway, I guess we'll thank our sponsors, uh, F&T <clears throat> for Harvesters. Everything you need for trapping, hunting with hounds, and predator calling. And um, Funky Trap Tags and Supplies. Alan, out of Iowa, has just about everything you need. And um, and some things you don't. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when he talked us into buying that collar? He's yeah. got lots of uh, collar collars too. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we, we've had we've had some fun buying things that we didn't need. Yeah. But we will go coon calling again because it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it turned out to be fun. Yeah, one so, of those uh, would come in handy around here. With, that would be fun. With all our spare time. Yeah, right. <laughs> and not, not too much of it. With the wind they have here, I'm not sure that you'd have to have that thing on high all the time. Uh-huh. I'm not sure I want one of these little grizzly bears come bearing down on me. Mm-hmm. These coon out here are, are big. It's springtime, and they, they're still big. They were really long. They're a lot longer. If you have never seen a North Dakota raccoon, they're, uh, I don't know, they look like a foot longer than what a northern Michigan raccoon is. And ours, you know, on the top end is like 30 pounds. So. Yeah, we caught one in a beaver set. Chris, you pulled it out of the water. And that thing was monster soaking wet. Usually, you know, they're shriveled up, look like scrawny little things. That was a monster coming out of the water. Yeah, and uh, I, the two that you, you skinned, Sarah, uh, I carried them down. I couldn't believe how much the carcasses weighed. <laughs> you know, usually it li- lightens them up quite a bit, but they still long. And yeah. In the fall, they'll have three or four inches of fat on them, too. When mm-hmm. I trapped out here, I had to put up a bunch of those raccoons on large coyote boards. Yeah. You know, oh, they're yeah. massive. That's right. Well, apparently everything isn't bigger in Texas. <laughs> So how many years have you been, you know, like you said, you and you are out here in the fall, and this, we said this is the spring, how, how long, how many trips have you made out here, and what, you know? This is my fourth one. The first time I came for muskrats, and then that fall I came for coyotes, and then the following spring I came back for muskrats, that was two years ago, and um, here we are again. Last year I didn't come out. I was busy and they had had a, a, a severe winter. The water was really low and uh, they had a month straight at 20 below. So I figured mm. that wasn't gonna do the muskrats any favors. But uh, 
this year looked good. They had a they had a bunch of rain and a bunch of snow last winter, and uh, it brought the water up. And obviously the the rats have bounced back pretty good. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Not in a lot of places. The places where I expected that we'd really be clobbering them, there aren't as many. But we're finding real good pockets of them other places. So a lot of country to cover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or over the next hill might be the the next new honey hole. Got to keep going. And, uh, you just mm-hmm. never know. And one side of the road might be really good, and then the other side is just uh, not great. So you got to stop at every uh, every available opportunity to see what's there. And you're a heck of a heart. You, I mean, you're, you're a great trapper, Chris. I, we've been riding around with you. And my gosh, I mean, you just, you're so organized. You've got so many traps and you, you've got a system and you've got it all figured out. And Like Haggerty. Uh, yep. <laughs> but, uh. Yeah. The way I figure, if I'm going to spend 30 hours in my truck driving here, I, be, I bet I had better be ready to, to hit the ground running when I get here. So. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> but it, well, take, it takes time. The first time I came out. For rats, <clears throat> just kind of winging it, and you know, I'd watch some, watch some videos and read what I could, and uh, and just try to figure it out as I went along. You've seen our, you've seen our floats. We're on the, the third generation. Third gen, I think. yeah. <laughs> I think the third generation floats are, will be around for a while. So talk us about talk us through Gen One, Gen Two, and Gen Three, and kind of what you've learned along the way just kind of kind of what how how has it changed from year one to to now kind of the first ones i built i I just copied the ones i had seen other guys using and you know plywood with some with some foam on the bottom for flotation and put some rails on the sides and uh and they were you know they were heavy and not really buoyant and uh, then I found some some thicker foam, and I said, "Why can't I just use that for for flota- flotation as well as um, being structural?" Mm-hmm. So then I started uh, putting putting rails on that and banging them together, and they they seem to work really well. Mm-hmm. You know, you get some chewed up a little bit once in a while. But, uh, we call that popcorn. Yeah, green popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Chris said. And that's a copyrighted term. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember it was one of the first floats I had set out there, and you came over and you said, did you get that, you know, about, did you get that stake in a good foot deep? And, and it, you know, is the float deep enough? Is so Otherwise, you're going to come back to popcorn. And I'm like, get back to the truck, and I'm like, I don't, talking, I don't know. I don't know. You're talking about popcorn. I'm like, what I'm not sure what about? popcorn means. And then we come back, and Jeff had the spot that wasn't. Anyway, there was popcorn at Jeff's spot, and I'm like, that's what he means. Yeah, the they, muskrat chews <laughs> the foam, or what do you call it? The flotation stuff, the, the foam, foam, and creates popcorn in the water everywhere if it doesn't. If it's not deep enough to drown, yeah, or it gets a hole right through the bottom of it. Yep. The only one I seen worse was the one you had, where it was uh, they chewed a hole through both. of sitting out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the majority of the time, you know, I, I like to use a, uh, you know, have some weight on the trap, you know, heavier oh, trap, yeah. and I'll add some. Um, I always add chain, and I'll put a length of heavier chain towards the trap. You know, to have that extra weight to get mm-hmm. the rat down to the bottom, but sometimes they'll hang on for a while and and make popcorn. So, what is your ideal trap setup? If I had to start o- over right from scratch, you know, I, I've got a I've got a hodgepodge of stuff now. Um, the majority of the ones I have are the the Bridger the Bridger one and a half specials. Um, great little trap, pretty heavy for its size, posi trip pan, machine chain, 
you know, right out of the box, it's pretty much ready to go. You had, you had to length the chain onto that. And, and it's got a bite size of one and three quarters. Mm -hmm. And how much chain, I'm not, how much chain is on each trap? I like to have um, at least 24 inches. Right. You know, that allows them to get off the float and, uh, you know, in a deeper water. water. And, you know, lots of times you're trapping right, right close to the vegetation, the cattails cat, cat or rushes, and they'll get tangled up in them. And It seems to be pretty effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like with all the rats we, we caught, I, I only had one foot situation. So, I mean, that's pretty dang good for that amount of rats. Mm -hmm. I've seen Clint before. He caught his first two rats in head foot situations. First two sets he ever made on a house, on a muskrat house, was he head foot situation. So, and we, I mean, out of, that, out of this many rat catching this many rats, and, you know, you don't have any twist outs, you know, other than the one, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, we were talking the other day. Uh, I don't mind killing animals one bit, but I don't. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to hurt them. Uh, you want to take care of business, you know, quickly and, and efficiently, and seems to be working. Mm -hmm. Work works good. The setup is great. Except for the fiberglass poles that you get fiberglass in your hands on. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, putting them in, uh, putting them in isn't bad. But I like to get them in there pretty deep. You see, when the wind kicks up, your your gear can end up on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. So when you pull them out, you definitely want to have gloves yeah. on there. Yeah, and you're going to be festering out fiberglass till Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned the wind. So if somebody's not familiar with North Dakota climate, maybe just talk about the climate, how it changes, and how your setups have to change. Yeah, this with is all that. This is a tough place. I mean, they, I would say they've got two kinds of weather. Real, it's windy and then really windy. <laughs> and but uh, you know, in the last few days, was it Sunday? We had t-shirts on, it was in the 70s. Blue sky, sunshine, the, all the sloughs were like a mirror. It couldn't have been prettier. Yeah, and you thought, you would think you could set anywhere. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, Sarah stayed back to do a bunch of skinning, and then Jeff and I went out to check our beaver traps and do some setting, and we got about two locations in, and uh, with both arms and a leg, you couldn't get the truck door open. No. So um, we passed on <laughs> setting, <laughs> setting out more gear. And uh, then today it was windy, cold, and rainy. Yep. So, yeah, the wind, when I, the first time I came up here, I had beautiful weather to start with, and I was sticking out floats everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> you know, a couple of days later, there was 60 mile an hour winds, and I was hunting all over the county for my for my equipment. So I've sure. learned the hard way to kind of watch the weather, see which way the wind's going to be coming from <coughs> and uh and to tuck with tuck those floats in behind some cover. You'll see how we mostly mm -hmm. we don't set up too much in the in the middle of the sloughs along the roads. So we'll keep them in the corners. I mean, there's definitely rats to catch there, but you know, if we get conditions like we had yesterday, mm -hmm. you're going to waste the majority of a day trying to find your gear. Yep. Uh, yeah, this is a, this is a rugged place. It really is. I had no idea how how the weather just and like you had mentioned about the wind cuz you had watched the wind and you're like, "Well, it's coming out of this direction for the next 2 days." But then in 2 days later, it's a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So it, it just turns around and twists and Yeah, if we were consistent, you could you could really get a big line out and uh you know even if he had to pass up some locations on the on the windward side but you set for the wind one day and then two days later it's the total opposite so i've learned to be a little a little more cautious mm -hmm. where we where we put our gear we still got caught on a couple spots mm -hmm. you know where we got there today and the float was 
blown up into the off the stake and you know you're out there with your potato rake yeah i got lucky i found i found every trap Mm -hmm. today which isn't always the case the tater fork the tater fork fork. yeah alan though (laughs) alan probably likes that win i bought 20 dozen of those bridgers from (laughs) one time he's hoping that i lose them all and buy another 20. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah this is a tough place the uh the people some rugged folks here are uh mm-hmm. our hosts the folks who own this the the house we're staying in um you know they're farmers and ranchers and just good hearted folks that they've gotten to be like yeah. like family for mm-hmm. me and you know friends with their children and but they're uh they're tough yep every day it doesn't matter i mean they're out there tending to those cows and yeah, they're calving. They're they're calving now, so they're they're out there. You know, ten o'clock at night. Two o'clock, you know, in, two the o'clock in the morning. Four five o'clock, o'clock in the morning. morning. <laughs> we see them the next morning, and they just look exhausted. <laughs> but she's out there making bottles, and they've been pulling calves and going to the vet at three a.m. and it's, it, they work hard for for everything that they have here. Yeah, it's good. The, the The people have been, are really receptive. You know, it's nice to come mm-hmm. somewhere to trap to and be welcomed. Mm-hmm. You get back east, and that's that's not always the case. Yeah. yeah, even down to we stopped at Shields. I didn't have a pair of waiters yet, so I stopped at Shields and checking out at the counter. And the la- there was two ladies at the checkout said, oh, "Are you going duck hunting?" And nope, trapping. And she says. They both said, oh, good, we need we need you. The muskrats, you know, we have them at our dock, and they're... Um... She goes, kill them little bastards. <laughs> yeah. She said, kill them little bastards. <laughs> they're putting seashells up on my dock. And I'm like, oh, my, we're in the right place. Yeah. Not not often do we hear that. Yeah, and it was, you know, you know, two women probably 65, 70 years old. And mm-hmm. like, kill them all. <laughs> Well, you've seen the damage that they do to these roads. Oh, it's crazy. It's crazy, the damage they do. Digging into them. Like, you almost got hurt bad on that one where you're walking down the side of the road and fell right into the muskrat. Yeah, I went down. I went down pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, they'll tunnel right under run right under the roads. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, I've never seen anything like it where they... Or just you know the roads are falling in from these from muskrats before, not like this. I've seen it like, you know, on people's ponds and stuff where it's kind of fell down, but not on you know county roads. Well, I know there's a ton of them that ain't gonna be digging no more holes <laughs> in the roads. And a bunch of beavers too. This is the most beavers I've ever seen here. Mm-hmm. We've been getting a bunch of calls and uh, you know trying to help help a couple folks out and catching their beavers and so far so good. Yeah, and these most of the time the western beaver I caught they had that western look to them. They were always you know down south like uh, you know say Texas or Louisiana, you know, and so it's Arkansas where they're you know short short fur you know it didn't look good. But uh, these things are beautiful up here. They got that kind of that silvery look to them, and yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah, they're nice. We haven't ate one here yet, so we don't know. I'm guessing they taste <coughs> good like Iowa's. They got, mm-hmm. you know, eating corn and basswood. Yeah, that one spot that I had trapped before you uh, got here, there was a a big bean field up above where they were and you could see all their runs from from last summer and fall mm-hmm. so i imagine they uh mm-hmm. i imagine they did a number on that bean field yeah which is weird because most of the time down to iowa I, I'm, I'm sure that somebody will, has caught beaver in a bean field but i've never seen where they were going up in the bean field it seems like they just moved down to the cornfield like they'll have their pond here you know and then like because in Iowa they'll in, they'll switch, you know, be beans this year, corn next year, generally back and forth. So, so 
where the beaver are now, they'll move down to the corn next year. You know, if they, they didn't catch them, and um, but I've never caught one going into a bean field. And like I say, I'm sure there's lots of them caught going into bean fields. It's it's generally corn because I've never seen their dam made out of bean stalks. <laughs> you know, it's always <laughs> corn stalks. You know. They can dev- definitely devastate some crops. Or if the muskrats can dig them holes, I imagine what a beaver would do. Then we, uh, you know, got the mink and. Yeah, you know. talk about the mink. That was a funny story. That was pretty cool. I li- I like it here because, I mean, basically, I mean, some season closed like the. You know, you trap um, muskrats till May 10th, and, um, you know, there's no closed raccoon season. There's no closed beaver season. Uh, you no know, closed coyote season. No coyote season, no closed badger, no closed fox. Um, you know, it's basically like, and right now, like, the coyote that you caught uh, for that rancher, uh, they look better than Michigan coyotes do, and in you know December so it looked so good we skinned it and getting it tanned you Mm -hmm. know and we were just catching it as a you know they don't want these coyotes around their calves so but when my friend this place is all I mean it's it's awesome that you know there's this you know you you don't have to have name tags except for you know on state land you know so on private ground I mean it, it really is like the wild west and no people what did you say? There's, we won't say what county we're in, but there's, we won't say uh, we won't we won't say the number because somebody could find. Yeah, it. there's not a lot of people in this county. Yeah, you know, there's 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 under in, in most of the counties I looked on around the eastern part of uh, North Dakota, there's like less than four thousand people in the whole county. You know, so I mean, it's it's pretty awesome that there's no people. Yep. I thought Texas was desolate, and then we get up here, and it's like, is there I, even a gas station? <laughs> like, how do we even get to one? Yeah, like, I looked at the, the just to go, I thought, well, you know, I'll run to town and get some pops or some beer or whatever, and uh, they close at 5.30. Every, and I thought, oh, actually, it must just be that one town that closes at 5.30, the gas station and stuff. No, they all close at 5.30. <laughs> I mean... In the they get up early. They the whole they all go to bed early. I mean it. it it's like the opposite of where we're from. <laughs> <laughs> They're open twenty four hours, but the county that I live in has two hundred thousand more people than the state of North Dakota. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Just the city. The county. Oh, the county. The county that I live in. Then yeah. the whole state. Yeah, in, in Erie County is. <laughs> pushing a million people and there's a little over 700,000 here hmm. and this is the populous half of the state the other side of the river it's uh it's a lot more sparsely populated than hmm. here yeah I've been I've trapped a lot of places you know and you know I really like it down to Texas but I never thought you know what I really would like to you know have a place there I would like to have a place here you know where you you know, I just come out here and, and stay and, you know, this, this was, because every place else was like, it's, you know, going to be too hot in the summertime, you know, and I only want to be there for a short period of time. You know, we're here, you know, you close everything up and be out it. When it's really cold, you can be gone. Go to Texas. Go to Texas. Well, that's what we do now, but. But yeah, it's it's a it's a great beautiful state. Nobody nobody should come here because then there's one more. Don't come here. <laughs> yeah. Disregard everything. This place said. sucks. This place sucks. <laughs> I remember hearing Clint say, you know, people asking him about what he does for freezing conditions and weatherproofing sets and all that. He says, I go to Texas. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was stuck doing what I was doing before. And I wasn't going anywhere, but uh, I kind of changed things a little. And now in the winter, I'll go to Mississippi and Texas. Yeah. 
Yeah. Whether it's broke as shit and have you as a clam. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, like, like, I'm looking at, when we're going through this country, I'm looking at, you know, like, where you can, sna- you know, the snaring opportunities and stuff, and, you know, it, it'd be, it would be a lot of fun, like, you know, we talked about in the wintertime, you know, coming here snaring, but, not like, they got tons of mink, and. Monster, I don't, I don't, monster I, mink too. I, they look yeah, like little yeah, otters. Yeah, they, they they do when they're crossing the road. I was like, is that an otter or is that a mink? <laughs> you know, and I'm we're you know setting one tens for them. And I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe a, you know, I mean, yeah, would a one ten kill them? Yeah, but to get them to put their head down and not jump over it, you know, so switch to two twenty. Well, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we uh, and then like uh, we're, we're, how that started was we were we're going down the road setting muskrat sets and like here like in Michigan you cannot shoot uh, an otter you can't shoot a beaver even if it's in your trap which is absolutely insane you know um, you can't shoot a uh, beaver otter or muskrat and I'm I don't know about mink because. Generally, we're not all there shooting them, seeing them and shooting them, but we're going down the road. Here you can shoot muskrats, you can shoot mink, um, you know, hunt them. And uh, we're going down the road and see this uh, this mink up on the... Chris says, there's a mink. He said, there's a mink. So... We stop. We, we stop, we jump out. I, you know, it looks it look kind of looks like a porcupine getting out with all the weaponry, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these mink dives under the water and we're waiting for them to come back up. It's just a shallow pool, maybe knee deep, and then Sarah's standing down the road. She goes, "There's that mink," and uh, everybody's seeing it at the same time. And the gunfire erupted, and uh, we got him. And uh, Chris said, "Oh, he was over there eating on a muskrat." And then we were walking back to Troy, says, do you, want, do you want that muskrat that mink was eating on? And we thought, you know, probably was, you know, no good or rotted for some reason. And then we went over there and Chris picked it up and it was, that mink had just killed that rat. And there was a little bit of blood on the throat, wasn't there? Yeah, there was one bite on the head and it was all warm and flappy. So we, yeah. we interrupted the poor guy's dinner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shot him to death. So, but yeah, that was a, a monster mink. Yeah, in northern Michigan, we ain't got mink like that. Probably a lot of the country ain't got mink like that. But they got a lot of feed here. And everywhere you go, there's tons of mink tracks. Mm -hmm. I got some great big ones down in Mississippi this uh, this winter. The last the last mink the mink that I sold um, probably must have been like 2013. I caught. I think it was three of them down to uh, Louisiana, and I sent them up to Napa, and I got twenty-four bucks a piece. That was the last mink I got. You know, decent money, and the price fell out of it after that. Um, well, this muskrat price isn't great right now, but we're just gonna have to catch more of them. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're here to catch. They, they definitely are. I know we post things on Facebook and they say, why are you going after them? The, you know, the prices, they're not worth anything, all of that. So what, I mean, you, like you said, you drove 30 hours to get here. The market for the muskrat is unknown. What, I mean, what inspires you or motivates you to, to come down here and, and chase muskrats? Just, it's cool. You just, it's, yeah, I'm not getting any younger, and uh, like like you used to go on a lot of big game hunts, you know, years ago. Mm-hmm. How how much money did you make on those? Not not too much, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And when I was doing all that, those hunts were, I thought they were expensive then, but they're they're four times more than that now. And if you figure that meat by the pound, ribeye is damn cheap. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the experience. Mm-hmm. It's the experience going, and we go to conventions all over the United States, um, and 
but you never see shit. We never see shit. You know, you're going to the convention and you're going to the next one. We can only see, you only see what's on the highway. I mean, we've seen, you know, with the area we're in, we've seen the veins and the blood and the guts of this country, you know, and, you know, you, you get to know it and, you know, I mean, you are feel like you're a part of it and know the area good and, you know, just driving down the road on a vacation, you don't, you, that, that, you are not getting that. Yeah, I, I'm out here to trap and uh, I want to catch as much as I can, but... Um, it is the experience, I and mean, we've seen hundreds of thousands of ducks and geese. Oh yeah! In beautiful and pheasants. In in pheasants, in sharp tail grouse, <clears throat> in flocks of pelicans. You wouldn't mm-hmm. think you'd see flocks of big mm-hmm. white pelicans flying around in North North Dakota. Because it reminds me of like Southern Michigan when I was a kid. My dad would be out skinning fur, and, and it's something I had never even thought about. It kind of slipped my mind. But hearing, like, we're all here skinning, and, um, you know, I hear one pheasant cackling, and then you hear one across the road cackling, you know, and there's four or five of them cackling. You know, I mean, it, it's something I, I didn't even know. I didn't even remember until it's, you know. Mm-hmm. The sunsets, yeah, I mean, you mm-hmm. took that beautiful picture uh, the other day, and I mean, we haven't been getting up early enough to see too many sunrises because we've been skinning too late. But uh, the sunsets, not so much today with this crappy weather. But uh, and, and you know, but like Sarah said, you know, I mean, people get on there and they say, you know, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, my question more is, is uh, why aren't you? You know, I mean, you know, you get somebody that says. Well, you know, in 1980, we got this amount of money. Well, there's been five fur booms since 1980. So you, you basically, you haven't set a trap since 1980. Apparently, the big one, when shit really went high in 2013, you missed that one. So if you miss that one, you're probably not going to hit the next one. You know, and the way it is now is, it's like last fall, everybody... We're putting up raccoon pictures. We're trapping raccoons. We're trapping raccoons. Why are you trapping them? They're not worth anything. And they were absolutely right. They weren't worth anything. Nobody didn't want them. You know what? Somebody wants them for, offered us 12 bucks, nose count, for scrapes and dried raccoons. So if we hadn't trapped them, where where are we going to go get them now? You can't go get them now. You know, so if you hadn't went out last fall, and because he offered you 12 bucks right now, that doesn't mean that next year that that market's there. You just got to, basically what my dad always told me, I'd say, well, I'm going to go out and do this, and I'm going to get, you know, this amount of leeches or minnows. And he said, you ain't done shit yet. He said, go out and catch them, and then worry about selling them. You know, and uh, if you ain't got them, you can't sell them. Yeah, a lot of guys I talk to, they're, they're waiting for the price to jump up, and then the, then they're chasing their tail. A, they're going to be sitting on a bar stool instead of trapping anyways. Yeah. But even if they did, you know, that 2000, what happened after 2013? $16 rats were $2 rats. Yep. So, yeah, these I'll, uh, if I can find um, a decent market for them, I will. If not, I'll uh, I'll sit on them as my, my brokerage account. Well, a you couple did. thousand muskrats. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, you know, before that fur harvester sale went off and you know they got a bunch of stale stuff up there that they sold and, and the, they sold the junk stuff and I you know I don't know why in the country the rats were you know 450 some of the sales were going for six to seven dollars for rats and as soon as the fur harvester thing went crappy uh, now you know they're saying that you know well the, you know, the rat market's struggling it, it's only struggling Number one, either you don't have the overseas market that you had because you'd already, I sold it overseas, you have a contract that they'll take this amount. It has nothing to do with fur harvesters. So either you really don't have the contract that you say you have and you're just sending your stuff to fur harvesters when you buy it, or uh, you're cheapening the price because fur harvesters had a sale, the price went down. And I mean, why? 
it has to work the other way then. You were only paying $75 for Bobcats, and they sold them same cats, say, for $150 in fur harvesters. Well, then the price should be $150 instead of 75 because you can't have it where the, the rats are affected, but the Bobcats aren't. It, it can't, I know it's nice to try and have it both ways, but you, it, it just doesn't seem right. So, I just, you know, I, I just want, uh, you know, to see the trappers. And, I mean, we, it's a lot of work going out doing this shit. And, you know, make as much as you can. I mean, the fur buyers got to make money, you know. But uh, and I, I don't mind even leaving some meat on the bone for them. Because I want, like we talked before. You know, we want them to be there next year to buy this stuff, and I don't want to send to Canada where, you know, it's like a disposable, you know, where you, you know, throw away your stuff, you know, it's basically, you know, so you ain't got to throw it away, you just let them do it, you know. So I want them guys out there, but I don't want them to make it all on, just on me, you got to spread it around. Yeah. You guys had, had hooked me up with that fella in, um, <coughs> in Louisiana. <coughs> Um, oh, Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry. Yeah. He's and, a, and, his, and his son. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gentlemen, both those fellas. And uh, I sold them all my all my beavers and uh, most of my otters and you know, a bunch of coons and a handful of coyotes that that were worth skinning down there. And, um, I mean, I was, I was pleased, mm -hmm. you know. I'm sure he's going to make some money on it. Yep. And more would have been better, but uh, yep. <clears throat> I didn't have to take what he was offering me. No, I could have hauled them thirteen hundred miles and then figured out what <laughs> tried to figure out what to do with them then, <laughs> and maybe got left. <laughs> yeah, and maybe got left. No, yeah, them guys are awesome guys. They, uh, yep, and they they treated us, you know, uh, really good. And they, uh, we tried to get hooked up with them this year on selling them our Arkansas beaver, but it just didn't. You know, they weren't in the same area where we were at when we were passing through and it just it didn't work out but we'd sell them in a minute wouldn't we mm -hmm. yep yeah they, uh, and we had good communication with them throughout you know we told him we were headed down there and what we were after and he checked in you know how's it going on the trap line and and then he checked back in you know how did you go you said you were going to be finishing up on this date how did it go and i mean yeah. It, it was a pleasant experience, and always, uh, like you said, they were always gentlemen. What I liked about he he wanted to buy the fur, mm -hmm. and he let me know he was. A lot of these guys, they act like they're doing you a great big favor mm -hmm. by uh, by buying their fur from you. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it was good. I'd be. I look forward to selling to him again. Yeah, yeah. That's how it was with us. He let us. You know, that, that, mm -hmm. I never thought of it like that, mm -hmm. but that's how they were. They were like, yeah, yeah, we want your fur. You know, and uh, they were just, it, it was a pleasant experience. When we were done, it was a, a pleasant experience. And um, I talked to his son quite a bit, messaging back and forth on Facebook. And, uh, you know, they're just such nice guys. He was, yeah, he was happy he agreed on the otter, pr uh, we agreed on an otter price, and then he saw all those Delta otters, and, and he got real happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we we didn't. We were gonna we were, get, we were getting ours tanned last year when we sold to them. So mm -hmm. we didn't sell many otter, but well, it's been good having some company. Mm -hmm. Normally, I I fly solo a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but uh, it's 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 good to do both. Yeah. Well, yeah, I said um, I would absolutely come back with trapping being a second part of the trip <laughs> because you have fed us so well. Yeah. I mean, Chris is like an amazing chef. Like, like we have gourmet suppers every night, and he yeah. just whips them. He's like, we're just going to have breakfast for supper. And in my mind, I'm thinking like a couple eggs and toast. Oh, no, we had... Or cereal. Yeah, or cereal. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had eggs, like so perfect eggs. Like, he made hard eggs, and he didn't even flip them. <laughs> uh, but we had hash browns. We had pancakes. He made biscuits one night. And, and then um, we had this, the sausage, yeah. What was that? It was, um, that was venison, venison yeah. I would say so the, good. My, the, and the bacon. The, the bacon. Yeah, like, the... he sliced the bacon <laughs> off of the thing, off of the slab. I would have to say the chicken and rice was no, 
number one, mm-hmm. but the moose burgers were like right neck and neck with them. And the moose burgers yeah. were awesome. And then we had uh, we had bear bolognese. The bear was mm-hmm. pretty good too. Nobody gonna know what the hell that bolognese. <laughs> I ate it. I don't even know what it is. It's I don't know. It's Spaghetti like, sauce with meat in it. Yeah, I, yeah. I would have if I was gonna describe it. I would describe it as soup on the spaghetti. <laughs> but it was awesome. It was so good. We even had uh I don't know what kind of soup that was. It had chicken in it and then it had some green stuff. It was a really good soup. Yeah, and he's like, Yeah, what'd you do? You made the bone broth overnight and all yeah, he this. Cooked the chicken bones all night. Yeah, he cooked the chicken last night and then picked all the meat off and let the bones simmer uh <laughs> let the bones simmer all night and made a stock and Today we got soup. Just like that. And tonight we had BLTs. And he says, you know, typically I make my own mayonnaise. Who makes their own mayonnaise? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like when we went out to eat eat us out at his house out to Buffalo, uh, when he made the coleslaw, he's like shredding the carrots. Yeah, shredded your own carrots. (laughs) This guy's got a a severe mental problem. (laughs) (laughs) That's the... Everybody always tells him, you know, have you ever thought about opening a restaurant? That That's what he used to do is head a restaurant. Restaurants. Yeah, enough of that. Yep, yeah, so when I think of North Dakota, I think of the the food. And then, you know, the muskrat chopping was, was good too, but the food was great. So thank you for taking care of us. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to have some company. I had some company down in Mississippi this year. I met a young... Uh, young fella at the Little Valley show and we started uh, I was talking to another guy about Mississippi and I looked over and his eyes were bigger as <laughs> saucers and I said hey you want to go to Mississippi and it turns out he had the time and um, a young guy named Bo Blanchard and uh, you know we've got you said that's Bill's grandson yeah Bill's grandson yeah. Bill's a pretty well known yeah, fellow guy. around he's the traffic community guy. so yeah Bo we we traveled down together. I was hauling my big trailer. He hauled the side by side down, and um, we had a uh, we had a really good we had a really good time down there. Did you guys drive down? You drove down separately. Yeah, he he was pulling my side by side with his truck. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the return trip, my uh, my son Chris came down, and we hung out for a couple of days, and <coughs> and then we went home, but. Yeah, Bo was good. We uh, caught a bunch of critters and had some crazy weather there, too. Mm-hmm. And we get down there, they had been having a drought, so everything was dried up. And That's fun. Mm-hmm. Because you're excited and get there and start setting like hell. And then, then, I, then I'm guessing that it rained and then it, the traps were underwater. Well, first it froze. We I'd send you a picture. Mm-hmm. We had four and you you could have driven a truck across the ice down there in four inches of ice and uh then we got a six inch rain <laughs> and everything that had been dry was all flooded out but uh but we made we made it work so the ice saved you basically <laughs> <laughs> that was rough i would have rather had the high water i uh i was down to louisiana one year and they got we got like i don't know two three inches of ice and it was all just like crystal clear, perfect ice for seeing, you know, bubbles under. So I'm got my bag on with some three thirties in it and I'm skating around the uh, you know, with my hip boots on around these ponds, walking on the ice and I didn't wasn't paying no attention. I'm just looking for the bubbles and you know, the air bubbles under the ice and I look up and there's a whole line of traffic. Remember this down in Louisiana there's a whole line of traffic stopped watching me walk out on the ice. <laughs> they they probably, you know, never seen that before. They're probably like, who's this suicide jockey? Yeah, those animals down there, too, up north, you get a cold snap, it gets them on the go, but it freaks them out. They, yeah. uh, I never seen one air bubble under the ice where anything came out under that ice. <laughs> Not one. The only thing I seen was... Uh, because there was snow, it was after the next night it snowed, and the next there there wasn't a coyote track I found in the snow. Uh, the only thing that moved was the bobcats, and I thought, well, shit, I'm just gonna ride around and mark where these bo- 
find every bobcat trail I could find and take, you know, mark it and, on the GPS and put, take, you know, some green flagging. I went around and flagged all them. Did it pay off? Yep. Yep, we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still got them marked, the spots marked on the map. They're probably all cut down now, but it must have been quite a few years ago, probably 10 years ago. So what was your favorite part of the muskrat trap in Sarah? Well, other than uh, the food. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the area. Um, the air just just being in engulfed in the area and seeing all the seeing like the pike at the at the pike spot like i was so obsessed with seeing the pike every time we drove by the pike were you know coming out of the of the water but <clears throat> i mean just the rep repetition of of catching so many muskrat and seeing them swim by and it just it reminded me of coon trapping in iowa it's similar to uh, muskrat trapping up here. It was just kind of similar, and you could drive and jump out, and then you'd have a muskrat or two or three or four. The day, I, the one day I checked the flow, and we had four. You made a four. We call them. He calls them four bangers. Four bangers. <laughs> and uh, put four traps on it, and we had four muskrats. Man, that was that was that was fun. Yeah, you know, and today we come up with a new term. They're caught by the head and a. Uh, Foothold is called a headbanger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just had a headbanger. <laughs> yep. But you know, Jeff and I aren't super organized, and we just kind of well, you're not. I am. jump in the truck and go. I mean, there is so much work. Is somebody that's just on Facebook looking at a picture saying, "Oh, it'd be really nice to catch 174 muskrats in a day." That. <laughs> There's so much work that goes behind that, and we have seen the amount of thought that you have put into these trips because you've done several of them. But you just want to talk about, like, all the work behind the scenes that somebody is not thinking about just to plan on coming on a trip like just this. Just to build them floats is a, a major undertaking. Yeah, but I, but I, I, enjoy, I enjoy that mm -hmm. stuff. I got my little for a shed slash right. shop and I get the table saw out and start building muskrat floats but I, I enjoy it and, and, mm. and even you know the trap prep um, the majority of the yeah. traps I have the, the springs cooked on them yes I, I appreciate those traps yeah yes. that uh, you know on a busy day you'll be you'll be setting hundreds and hundreds of traps you know with your and they with without those springs weakened up a little bit, you just tear your hands up, mm -hmm. and you don't need uh, you don't need the most powerful trap in the world to hold the muskrat. Mm -hmm. Then when you're out, you're, you're out in the waters. You, you know <clears throat> you can be up to your knees or up to your waist, mm -hmm. and and uh, you can just set the traps. They're easy to manipulate. You set them with your hands instead of having to put them on your knee. And so we're talking like I don't know, sixty, seventy dozen traps. Yeah, I think I came out here with, I had a bunch that I left out here two years ago for my last trip. These these folks that we stay with, I've got a corner in the one room in the barn with a, <laughs> a mountain of float in, uh, mm -hmm. floats and milk crates full of uh, traps stacked up to the ceiling. My uh, favorite thing when it, that we walked in that shed, I could not stop laughing pulls out the muskrat basket that goes on top of the truck <laughs> what the heck oh my gosh i could not stop laughing he's talking about this basket that he has it goes on top of the truck to uh air dry the the muskrats and so we drug it out of the barn and he screwed it to the top of the thing that was funny i don't know why i thought yeah, that was getting, so funny getting but. the fur dry is uh is, is a chore like right now, it's yeah, like, raining, raining out, and it yep. can't get them dry. Right now, it's it's you know it's raining and it's humid, and uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll get them dry. But uh, when I stop back here, I've got some some two by threes mounted to the telephone pole and the mm -hmm. staple gun. You staple them with by the tail and let them let Mother Nature dry them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that rack I put on top of the truck, 
one to get them dry and, and b you see the amount of gear that's In that's back, involved yeah. those floats and all the traps they take up a lot of space so every cubic inch under that cap that you have access mm -hmm. to is uh there's more stuff more crap right. you can haul around and highly organized <laughs> i know i put three rocks back there and uh <laughs> i could tell chris is like sarah you and these rocks is <laughs> I put the rocks where a crate needed to go, and yeah, every inch is. No, they're uh, in the back seat. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to put them in the back seat. Yeah, before we go set, it's pretty organized. But Jeff saw yesterday when we're pulling, it Cream stuff comes out of the water, and in the back of the truck yeah. it goes, and mm -hmm. empty it out when you get back here, and, and then do it all over again. Yep, so you have floats, you've got traps, you've got stakes. And then the fur handling stuff, I mean, how many freezers did you bring? And, how, you know, all the fur has to be froze and the meat and... Yeah, there's a lot, logistically it's, you know, there's a lot to, a lot to figure out. But, it's, you know, by trial and error, you just try, I, I just try to get more, more efficient. You know, I think I've got a, an okay system, but, you know, you look for ways to save, um, to save seconds. You know, if you can save 10 seconds on a muskrat and you got 172 of them out there, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's sleep. Yep. You know, if you're skinning till midnight or one or two in the morning and up by six or seven, you know, time's, mm -hmm. time's pretty precious. Yep. But we did take a lazy day. We did. Drove to the city. We took it. We took a short day, and the uh, pair of waders that I had been using were leaking a little bit. Then they started leaking a lot, and then my backup pair of waders they must <laughs> they must have shrunk. They shrunk. Know, I hadn't worn them in a couple of years, and they which, which goes goes which goes back to the uh, the good food he's making. <laughs> yeah, they shrank. Quite a bit. I, I got in them, but I couldn't get my feet more than six inches off the ground. You went to get, get in the, the truck. truck. <laughs> he said, oh, he went, he these went, aren't going to work. Yeah, he went to get in the truck to put his leg up to get in the truck and couldn't get in the truck. He, he just turned, he didn't say, no, I'm just turning around and walk back to the house <laughs> and put his leaky legs back I was dying. I, th I think I said, heck with this, but in a little different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we took a ride into Bismarck. Went to Shields and sniffing around for waders, and Sarah found a five hundred dollar pair of waders marked down to a couple of hundred bucks, mm -hmm. and um, they're better than the other ones because the old ones both legs were leaking. These brand new ones, only one of them. Had. <laughs> so you're getting better. Yeah. It's hard to believe they have a pair of waders that's, you know, $500, and you they got a hole in them. <laughs> when you take them back, you should ask them, say, oh, is the pair that doesn't leak, a, is it cost 1000 Because I'm, yeah. <laughs> whatever it costs, that's what I need. Yeah, it's a little hole now, but I don't imagine it getting any smaller by the, uh, by the end of the trip. No. Yeah, um, that night we went to, went to an awesome Mexican restaurant. Oh, we did. We had table side guac. So good. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, the lady comes up and says, would you like me to make guac for you? Well, yeah. hell yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't really like onions and I don't really like jalapenos. And Chris is like, so you're basically going to eat an avocado. <laughs> it was darn good, though. Mm -hmm. Got jalapenos on the side. Turned out pretty good. He had to go to town from, it was only a 70 mile ride. To, yeah, yeah, to go to town 70 miles. <laughs> we thought we were desolate in Texas when it was 45 minutes. There's a neat little town to the west of us, a ways yeah. though. We stopped the grocery store and yeah. see my old buddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's this old, there, there's this, oh, this old town, like, and well, he goes in and asks this guy at the grocery store. It's only open till like five o'clock, and he says, uh, "What's happening?" 
And the guys told him, he said, well, Mary doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> like, we know who Mary is. <laughs> and he said, uh, hey, but the bar's open over in this other town. <laughs> We've been by this, and it it looks like an abandoned town, like a ghost town. And we're like, there ain't no way in hell that bar's open. I mean, there's cobwebs in the winter, in the spring, <laughs> and there's bars on the window. I mean, it looks like it's abandoned. And then the other day, that well, guy Friday. gives good information because um, the lights, they had their bush lights, blinking bush light sign on in the window, and they were, they were open. Yeah, it was Friday night. Yep, Friday night, they were open. So, that guy ain't full of shit. He, know, he knows what's going on. Mary don't work there no more, and that bar's open. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't sure what he knows other than that. He wasn't there today when we stopped. Yeah, he said, what's new in the last two years since I've seen you? Well, Mary doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. But, yeah, these people out here have been, they've been really good to me. You know, they call us, you know, about the beavers. Like, you know, you're trying to make a couple bucks doing this. And, you know, down in Mississippi, you lot charge for a lot of the beaver work. And they ask, oh, what's it going to cost? And. You know, we've been doing it for, we haven't been, we haven't been charging them. You know, the beavers are worth a couple of bucks and mm -hmm. a little bit of goodwill. And these folks are, have been really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of numbers in my phone there. And I guarantee just, I could call just about any one of them. You know, my truck falls through the road and <laughs> a muskrat. Well, even today you said, you know. It was it was rainy. The guy called and said, "You know, have did you check?" And he said, "Well, it's kind of rainy and don't want to get stuck." And he volunteered. He said, "If you do get stuck, I've got a tractor and Keith has a tractor, <laughs> so you know, just don't be afraid to call." And normally they would say yeah. the opposite, like be irritated by that. No, they uh, definitely some good people up here. They, uh, yeah, it's like the day when we went over to. Uh, you know that's what's what's so cool about here, up here is with the the people's attitude, um, you know, and the, like they say the laws. You know, it's like Chris said, "Well, what do you think about you know going to get them waiters today?" And I told him, I says, "What good is having no check time? Because there's no check time here if you never use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's run them tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we did. Run part of them and then." Check the rest the next day. Yeah, and what's it? What's everything's, it is, everything's dead. Everything's yeah. dead. When what's it, it? That water is still. Even when it was uh, in the seventies, a couple days ago, I uh, was running without gloves, putting in colony traps. You stick your arm down in there. <laughs> it's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty cold. Yeah, they're not. They're not getting green bellies real fast in that water. But no, it's, it's, it's definitely awesome. You definitely have to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And you, when he tells this story, <laughs> you have to imagine where we're at, where there's less than 4,000 people in the whole county. You When you get out on a county road, you open the doors. I don't even shut my door anymore. I just get out. and we're Sometimes parking. we're in the middle of we're the road. We're in the middle of the road. With the doors open, there's nobody coming down these roads. I mean, they're even coming. if we see a vehicle, we're like, "Oh, there's a vehicle!" Like we haven't <laughs> seen one in so long. Yeah, and most of the time on the cement roads, Chris is on the wrong side. He thinks he's in. He, he's from England. Yeah. And we're driving down the wrong side of the road in the ditch. <laughs> you know, but uh, so you know, there's nobody around. Well, you're talking about the Fagawa. Yeah, the Fagawa. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on our way back from. We're, we had one slough left to look at. We we're getting close to where we uh, where we're staying. Uh, the state road. I mean, it's literally there's nothing for miles and miles and miles. Great big country. You see forever. And we're going down the road, and there was a a bicycle going the other way. And when we passed him, the guy stopped, and he was just in the middle of getting off his bike. And we had some floats not too far from there. I'm like, what the heck's this guy doing? First of all, what's a guy doing on a... And he wasn't like a 
a recreational bicycle, <laughs> bicyclist with no. a stupid helmet and those gay little shorts on. No. Um, no. There was definitely something <laughs> different about this guy. So I slow down. I'm looking in the rear view mirror. I'm watching. I'm watching. And see, he's laying on the ground. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So we stop in the middle of the road. You got your binoculars <laughs> I, out. <laughs> I get the binoculars out. And he's just laying there. So we turn around and drive right up next to him. And uh, he was laying there. I think he was drinking out of the... Yeah, he, was he looked like a wild animal. Slough. Yeah, he he uh, he was drinking out of that slough. We're, I mean, oh my God. Some of them stink so bad uh-huh. from rotted shit in there. And musk, I mean, muskrat shitting all over the place. And this guy, I started talking to him. I'm like, you okay? And he, uh, he definitely had some chemical influence going on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what his deal was, but he was... He wasn't looking at you. He, he was, was like... He was out there. Yeah, he kept putting his head down, and he, he was acting really weird. Yeah, and he had a, a pink duffel bag over his shoulder, and he was, look, he, he was looking for a city. I'm like, well, you're a long way from a city, Jack. <laughs> and uh, seventy miles to be yeah. exact. <laughs> and then uh, he goes, he told me he didn't have any money, and then he was looking for a McDonald's or a Jack in the Box. And, <laughs> um, it was just bizarre because I mean we're on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, and I said, where did you, where did you come from? He, he goes, uh, Fargo. I mean that's a oh. long, long way from here. And, um, I mean, I felt bad for him, but we weren't going to adopt him, so Sarah, <laughs> made, partially him a, did. <laughs> Sarah made him a peanut butter sandwich, and I gave him a Mountain Dew, we said, see yeah, you later. He, he was eating the, the sandwich the last time we saw him. <laughs> oh, goodness. But, uh, he got the nickname, uh... What's the nickname we gave him? Oh, the Fagawe? Yeah, you have to tell why we call him that. <laughs> oh, he, uh, the Fagawe Indians, they're a, a nomadic tribe that used to be in this <laughs> Which, in this area. Chris tells me this like it's a real thing. Like <laughs> He's like, Sarah, do you know about this tribe that's out here? <laughs> yeah, they well, just... Well, that, and, and you told the same story to the uh, the rancher lady <laughs> yeah. that, that owns this place. He's, t- he's telling her today... About this nomadic tribe, and she's, yeah, they just, she's just looking like really, really, around here. <laughs> yeah, they wander the the plains aimlessly, saying, "Where the fuck are we?" <laughs> 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 so that that's this guy was the chief of the <laughs> Fagawi, because <laughs> he didn't have no idea where he was at. Yeah. Well, one thing we learned about the Fagawi is is that uh, they do like Jack in the Box. Mm-hmm. So if you're ever around a Jack in the Box, you might see a Fagawi there. <laughs> if you see somebody, if with he a, has a pink duffel yeah, bag, if, you if know you where see he a guy came with a, from. If you see, and we always wondered where this guy ended up. So if you see a, a guy buy a Jack in the Box with a pink duffel bag on a bike <laughs> that uh, looks like he came across the border, the southern border. <laughs> and what'd you say about his his tire on his bike? It only had three rotations left. Yeah, there wasn't much <laughs> tread left on that. But God bless him. I hope he's okay yeah. and found where he was going. Yeah, I I, I don't he, see a long, happy life for him. Not the way things are going for him now. He can change things and. Oh, well, he could change, but I mean, on the current course. Yeah, just was, the drinking out of the muskrat slew. Um, yeah, he was in rough shape. But. Let's go, Brandon. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say the last time this uh, county voted for the bad guys? 1932? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this is uh, yeah, my kind of place. This is these are definitely my people here. The uh, trappers are only ones. That, the trappers have this, a lot of times the same mentality as these people here. <laughs> you know, just want to be left alone. We're we're doing our thing. You do your thing. As long as it doesn't interfere with what I'm doing, I don't give a shit what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, that's 
and and, there, and there's not a lot of them to uh you know except for like you said like the weirdos you know down there where they're from somewhere else moved here and they uh well you know they told chris uh you know he said well can i get permission to you know trap this oh no because you know it would uh devastate our son to see something dead (laughs) well do you realize that you live in cattle country in north dakota you know why did you move here yeah there's uh that's always the problem is is people uh are somewhere and they don't like the way things are there so they move to somewhere that's not like that and then they want to have it exactly like the shithole they come from mm-hmm. well don't do that to north dakota just stay go somewhere else because <laughs> it's it's <clears throat> it's great here this is like the last american hold i thought alaska was but this is even you know m- more yeah I- it's whatever, I mean, it's what every every trapper I ever talked to, this is exactly, you know, the mentality of people that they they wish was in their area. Yeah, I love coming here and, and, and spending time here, but, you know, I love it around where I, where I live, too. But it's just nice to be able to, you know, you guys do it together, mm-hmm. you know, and but you had done it. You were solo for decades yep. running around the country, but... Um, yeah, I'm fortunate to have uh, somebody at home to, uh, you know, hold down the fort and take care of business and be uh, an understanding trapper companion. So, yeah. mm-hmm. thank, thanks, Allison. Yeah. And we won't tell her what, what she calls you. <laughs> yeah, that's not for uh, public public consumption. She knows she, she knows what we're talking about. It's not flattering. <laughs> I thought it was kind of complimentary. Well, but... it was, but I don't think she meant it that way. <laughs> I don't think it was meant in a positive <laughs> way. Um, so we hadn't done, we were planning on doing a, uh, podcast, you know, kind of talking about our Texas, you know, adventures and, you know, a lot happened down there with Albert and, um, we had, uh, hit a snag on doing that, which we'll probably talk about at a later time, but we definitely are going to be doing a podcast talking about, you know, Texas and stuff, right? And, uh. You know, covering some of the stuff that happened down there, and you know, because mm-hmm. uh, we had a great time in Arkansas. And, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we basically and, uh, we, beaver season is still open in Michigan, so yeah. maybe we'll be out with Haggerty. Yeah, Jeff's supposed to uh, come next up. week. Yeah, I sure hope he comes up. But mm-hmm. uh, and don't forget grinding up muskrat carcasses. Oh, oh yeah, the highlight of your. Uh, we got to get them all the way back to Michigan via yeah. Iowa. Yeah, we got so. a whole load of carcasses. You can't put another rat carcass in the back of that, in the back of that three-quarter ton. Plus, she had just picked up a whole load, and we filled the freezers before we came out here. Mm-hmm. Plus, we got, like, I don't know, was there 150 buckets that are in, that got to be dealt with, plus three pallet loads of meat at F&T. I got to pick up. We're, we it, we got the house in Iowa, then we got the house in Michigan, and the one in Michigan's in the like lowlands, and in the spring you can't. I tried to drive out there last year, and buried the three quarter ton truck out there, and they had to come pull me out with an excavator, and uh, when we were getting ready to go to Iowa, it was like that, and F and T was nice enough to let me just you know leave the three pallets there from Nick and um, so we got to deal with that when we get back and that's like you know a lot of people you know say well you know I'd like to do that and I love what I do but uh, you know having to deal with you know rotted meat in July and stuff no you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> if you don't like flies not 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 for you it's one time I was, us- I was using that uh I don't remember one of the fly killing baits, and I was putting it on top of the 
thing killing the flies and <coughs> there were so many flies that they would get like four or five inches deep inches deep of dead flies on top of them you know the barrels trying to get into them I got them all blocked off so they can't get in there and there was dead bodies of flies you could tr- track the dead bodies out the driveway <laughs> <laughs> I've never it's never been like that before that or after and the thing is there was, then there was so many wasps and yellow jackets around there because they're eating the dead bodies of the flies it's just, it was like a nightmare so glamorous hey we have a good life <laughs> well thanks for it, coming up here and just, playing, it just and playing for a week well yeah, thanks for having us I know I, you've put in a lot of work to get uh, a trap line to this point and uh, we appreciate all the hard work that you've done up to this point and taking care of us and keeping everything going I mean you were just out there before we hopped on here turning the muskrats like hot dogs on a grill (laughs) make sure that they're drying out there so definitely kept things moving for us so yeah I was laying down taking a nap when you when you come down rousing me out yep Thanks for joining us again on the show. Yep. Hopefully see you next week. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right.